Good morning. Welcome to worship at the Wallace Presbyterian Church in Wallace, North Carolina on this, the first Sunday of Advent. It's a wonderful time as we begin our anticipation of the celebration of the birth of our Messiah. There's some information in the bulletin today about the meaning of the season of Advent, more than just making sure all the presents are bought and all the baking is done, all the decorations are up. A time of reflection, a time of anticipation, a time of looking back to the first coming of our Lord in Bethlehem, a time to consider the importance of his return as he promised. And all through the season of Advent, our worship services, our music, the scriptures, the decorations, everything is designed to help us think on those two things. So again, thank you for being here, all who are here today in the sanctuary and everyone worshiping with us online. The beautiful flowers in the sanctuary today are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Harry Toots Carlton and William Bill Saunders, and we thank their families for this beautiful arrangement. We will have our Advent worship services in person this year. We will not be having Advent luncheons following the services. Our first service is this coming Thursday at 12 noon here in the sanctuary. Our speaker will be Reverend Martha Highsmith and the special music will be provided by Devin Riley. We will have Zoom Bible studies on Monday night and Wednesday morning this week. You can look around and see the beautiful decorations in the sanctuary that were put up by a great crew that worked here yesterday. And I wanna thank the following people, Susan Walters, Joyce Ainge, Harriet Ferrier, John Ward Ferrier, Hattie B. Ferrier, Dave and Brenda Long, Joey Fussell, Carla and Wayne Castine, Zach Addy and Clara Castine, Susie Goss, Georgia Longus, Greg and Geneva Moretti, and Andrew White. And we especially want to thank David and Jill Johnson of Johnson Nursery for donating our beautiful Christmas tree, Christmas tree. It's a live tree that will be planted on the church grounds after the season of Christmas. Lots of announcements and information included in our bulletin today. The lighting of the Advent wreath this year will be done uh, by a youth from the church along with an elder, the choir and the congregation. So after um, we decorate the Christmas tree, um, you will be asked to participate in the lighting of the candle and that will be found on the insert in your bulletin. While Vera plays some music, if you would like to, I invite you to come forward to get one of the Christmas ornaments and hang it on the Christmas tree as we worship God.
Miller Ludlam and Hope Turnbull are going to lead us in the lighting of the first candle. is the time to wait. Advent is the time to wait for freedom from captivity. Advent is the time to wait for comfort in our sorrow. Advent is the time to wait for power in our weakness. Advent is the time to wait for the end of darkness. that our hope is in Christ and that God sent Jesus to be the light of the world. As we begin the journey of Advent, may we learn to wait patiently with hope and confidence that God's light will one day illuminate our darkened world. Let us pray. God in heaven, as we begin this season of Advent, we pray that you will teach us to wait with patience, endurance, and trust. Remind us of your everlasting presence. Fill us with the hope for the future and love for humanity. Bathe us in your eternal loving light. Amen.
Please join me in the opening sentences. The days are shorter and darkness comes early to our lives. Lord, hear our prayers through the darkness. Come, seek the Lord. Place your hope in God's mercy and love. Lord, we seek your presence among us. Look closely. God is making us ready. Lord, brighten our spirits this day and help us to receive your good news. Amen. In Advent, we prepare for the coming of Christ, full of grace and truth. Trusting in God's unfailing grace, let us tell the truth about ourselves as we join in our prayer of confession in unison, in silence, and in our assurance of pardon. Let us pray together. God, our Maker, we confess that we are not ready to meet you. We study the trends of our times and ignore the signs of your reign. We trust in things that pass away and forget your eternal promise. Forgive us, God of grace. Strengthen us by your hand so that we may be ready for that day when you come to reign in glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, hear our prayers. Every valley is lifted up, every mountain made low. Now the glory of the Lord is revealed, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us sing God's praises for his mercy in our lives. Please be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come up and get another Christmas ornament and finish decorating the tree. If you want to get two, I think there are enough. Let's stick into the.
I'm getting it on there, okay? When you finish, come stand over here by the tree and we'll talk about it for a minute. We'll look at everything. job. That it? One last one. Oh, two. Maybe not. <laughs> Y'all are doing a great job. Okay, once you put your ornaments on, stand back here with me and we'll look at it. Isn't that pretty? Yes. Now, we have a special name for that tree. It's called a Chrismon tree. Sounds kind of like Christmas tree. Chrismon. I want you to look at those ornaments and tell me some things you see. What shapes do you see? Crosses. You see a star, Jack? Yeah. Angels. Butterflies. A snowflake, crown, crown. Stars. stars, lots of crosses, yeah. Uh, Anybody see a fish? fish. Yeah. Fish. Yep. Bells. Bells. Yeah. Did you know? Did you know that people in the church made all of those ornaments? They didn't go to the store and yeah, didn't go to the store and buy them. People made them, and all of those. Ornaments remind us of Jesus, like the crown, that he's the king, and the star from the star that led the wise men, and the fish about Jesus feeding the people with the fish. And so every time you look at that tree, you can find a different ornament, and it reminds you about Jesus, like we just sang. He's the light of the world, and he's the savior of the world. And I think y'all did a great job decorating it. But they keep falling off, don't they? <laughs> For some reason they do. For some reason they do, Mary Cameron, that's right. Well, I tell you what, once you get those on, come back here, we'll have a prayer, and then maybe we'll fix it up during the, yeah, just leave them, that's right, obviously they're all falling, it's like it's snowing ornaments. <laughs> Okay, this might end. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if you've got an ornament in your hand, come over here and let's have a prayer together and then we'll figure out what to do, okay? Okay, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful Christmas tree and for the people that made the ornaments. Lord, help us every time we look at it to remember that you are the light of the world and that you are our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you've got an ornament, how about handing it to me? I think the more we put on, the more we're gonna fall off. And then we'll figure out how to take care of it. If you're gonna... Probably because there's so many ornaments. If you're going to go to Children's Church, go with Miss Geneva right here. We're going to use the same prayer for illumination <clears throat> all throughout Advent. I invite you to join me today as we get ready to hear God's word. Let us pray together. Speak to us, Lord. 
Speak to us in the waiting, the watching, the hoping, the longing, the sorrow, the sighing, the rejoicing. Speak to us by your word in these Advent days and walk with us until the day of your coming. Amen. Our epistle lesson comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then, let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, as indeed you are doing. Advent are not about Christmas. They're about the anticipation of the coming of Christ then and now. And today we hear from uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. And I invite you to listen for the Word of God. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you this, generation, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life and that day catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Here's how Frederick Beekner describes Advent in his book called Whistling in the Dark. The house lights go off and the footlights come on. Even the chattiest stop chattering as they wait in darkness for the curtain to rise. In the orchestra pit, the violin bows are poised. The conductor has raised his baton. In the silence of a midwinter dusk, there is a far off in the deeps of it somewhere a sound so faint. For all you can tell, it may only be the sound of the silence itself, and you hold your breath to listen. You walk up the 
steps to the front door and the, the empty windows at either side of it tell you nothing or almost nothing. For a second, you catch a whiff in the air of some fragrance that reminds you of a place you've never been and a time you have no words for, and you are aware of the beating of your heart. The extraordinary, extraordinary thing that is about to happen is matched only by the extraordinary moment just before it happens, and Advent is the name of that moment. The Salvation Army Santa Claus clangs his bell. The sidewalks are so crowded you can hardly move. Exhaust fumes are the chief fragrance in the air, and everyone is as bundled up against any sense of what all the fuss is really about as they are bundled up against the wind chill factor. But if you concentrate just for an instant, far off in the deeps of you somewhere, you can feel the beating of your heart. For all its madness and lostness, not to mention your own, you can hear the world itself holding its breath. For years, I have appreciated Frederick Beekner's description of Advent, the, the way his words make you sit on the edge of your seat, the way his images stoke the anticipation of the extraordinary, the way he locates Advent in the busyness and the rush and the humdrum of our daily lives. Well, this past week, I lived out Frederick Beekner's description of Advent when Nancy and I were in New York City for Thanksgiving. On Wednesday, and Bill's going to show some pictures up there. On Wednesday night, we went to see Porgy and Bess at the Metropolitan Opera House at the Lincoln Center. And it was almost exactly like Beekner described. The lights were up. Everybody was talking and chattering. You could hear the musicians down in the orchestra pit tuning up and that sort of thing. We had gotten some discount tickets through a friend of our son, Jackson. I thought, you know, we'd be up in the balcony somewhere, fifth row back, center stage. And the conductor came out, and he raised his baton, and everybody got quiet. It was just like... Frederick Beekner described. And then we were walking around downtown Manhattan all of Wednesday afternoon, and the streets were crowded, and people were rushing around, and it was cold, and we went down to Rockefeller Center and watched people ice skate on the skating rink there in front of the big Christmas tree, and it was cold. <laughs> and the wind was blowing, and did I say it was cold? <laughs> there were a lot of exhaust fumes, horns honking, cabs rushing by, people going back and forth. We stood and looked at the window displays in all the big department stores, and it was really cold. <laughs> and you know, <clears throat> I figured we would hear Salvation Army bells, and as we were walking toward Rockefeller Center, we got down there and we stood in front of the skating rink, and then I heard them, and I walked up, and I've never seen any Salvation Army bell ringers like these guys, and I took a video, and Bill's going to show it to you, and can't they come out and watch it? Come on. These guys were great, and guess what? Their pot was full of money, and you'll see why in just a second. Hey, Bill. Bye. 
<laughs> so I went up to talk to the guy, and I said, I'm a preacher from North Carolina, and you're going to be in my sermon on Sunday. And he said, God bless you, sir. God bless you. And the people were putting the money in their pot. I've never seen anybody do that at the Walmart in Wallace before. <laughs> but I think they need to watch it and take a clue. So thank you. Well, you can sit there if you want to. It doesn't matter to me. All right? <laughs> you want them to come back up there? You sure? Okay. So it was just like Frederick Buechner described, that sense of anticipation and all the hustle and bustle and everything. And But you don't have to be in New York City over Thanksgiving to find it hard to concentrate in the midst of a mad world, a maddening world, a world that seems like it's lost. And on top of everything else that demands our attention day in and day out, you know, we've added the challenge of an almost two-year-old ongoing pandemic. The, now we've added on a, the rush of the season and a long to-do list over the next four weeks to get ready for Christmas. And it's just hard to do what Beekner talks about, to be quiet and to, to be silent and to try to listen for that silence. But that's why the season of Advent is important if we take it seriously and if we pay attention during the next four weeks. Perhaps we will find some time to concentrate and as he says, far off in the deeps of us somewhere, we will feel the beating of our hearts. And I think the beating of our hearts is that longing that we have maybe more now than ever, a longing for God's hope, peace, God's joy, and God's love to be as real in our lives and in this world as the clanging of the Salvation Army bells, as the cold temperatures that, that nip at your nose and the, the hectic schedules of our lives. Those are so real and so tangible and so time and energy consuming. And we want God's love and peace and joy to be as real as those things. And that's why our Advent hymns, I think, sound the way they do. You know, it's November 28th. We're not singing a Christmas carol today. A lot of the Advent hymns are, some people say they're so depressing. They're so mournful. Well, yes. They're talking about that longing and that that sense of anticipation, and if you ever pay attention to the, to the lyrics, you hear, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appears. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in the dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. While we are waiting, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, our Emmanuel, while we are waiting. And I wonder, though, if the whole world really holds its breath during Advent. Now, for a lot of things, I think we are holding our breath for other reasons than Advent. We hold our breath to hear the latest reports and recommendations about COVID-19 and its variants. We hold our breath and we wait as we wait to get the results of medical tests. We're holding our breath as we wait to hear the newest economic news. We hold our breath as we hear about events overseas that we can no longer say don't affect us because it's over there somewhere. We hold our breath because of the deep political and social and racial divisions in our country, and we hold our breath for the reports of the next mass shooting or 
a natural disaster, and the list just goes on and on. That's why we hold our breath these days. Except for the specifics, not much has changed in the last 2,000 years when it comes to holding our breath. When Jesus talked about the coming of the Son of Man, He talked to people who were holding their breath about what Rome would do next, about where their next meal would come from. They were holding their breath about how to be faithful to Jesus Christ and to God in a hostile world. And when the gospel writers told their stories about Jesus, they were talking and writing to Christians who were holding their breath about what would happen to them if they stayed true to their faith in Jesus Christ, about what life would be like when Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. They were holding their breath about the pressing needs of caring for their families day in and day out. So to them and to us, Jesus' Advent message is a call to stand up and raise our heads, to be on guard and to be alert, because as Jesus said, your redemption is drawing near. So listen again to Jesus' final warning in today's gospel text. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day, the coming of the Lord, does not catch you unexpectedly. Now, you might be thinking, you know, I've heard this before. You did two weeks ago on November 14th from Mark chapter 13. Almost the exact same words. Mark's parallel passage. And I ended that sermon talking about how the Presbyterian Church USA adopted a brief statement of faith in the 1980s, early 90s, following the reunion of the old northern and southern Presbyterian churches. And I said then that the affirmation of that faith statement at the very end clearly conveys the message of confidently hoping and watchfully working until the Lord comes again. And this morning, we're going to use a portion of that brief statement of faith as our affirmation of faith. And a little bit of it says, in gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our whole daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. And so Advent reminds us to watch and to wait in a world that constantly demands our attention, constantly saps our energies, and a world that can even shatter our hopes and dreams. And most of us aren't very good at waiting. If our Amazon package takes longer than a day to arrive, if we have to sit through more than one cycle of the traffic light, if our internet connection is a little slower than usual, we get irritated. How then are we supposed to wait on God and God's purposes to be fulfilled, especially when so many things around us tempt us to think that God's promises might not be true, might not be trustworthy after all? In a book of Advent devotions that was published 20 years ago, interestingly enough, the writing for November 28th, 20 years ago, is called Waiting for God. It was by Henry Nouwen, and he writes these words, Waiting is active. Most of us think of waiting as something very passive, a hopeless state determined by events totally out of our hands. The bus is late. You can't do anything about it. You just have to sit there and wait. So, he writes, it's not difficult to understand the irritation people feel when somebody says, just wait. Words like that seem to push us into being passive. But, he says, there's none of this passivity in the Scriptures. Those who are waiting are waiting very actively. They know that what they're waiting for is growing from the ground on which they're standing. And that's the secret, he says. The secret of waiting is the faith that the seed has been planted that something has begun. Active waiting means to be present fully to the moment in the conviction that something is happening where you are and that you want to be present to it. He writes, a waiting person is someone who is present to the moment, who believes that this moment 
is the moment. A waiting person who believes that this moment is the moment is a person who is holding his or her breath for God to do something. Remember what Beekner said? You can hear the world itself holding its breath. Now, when we hear that, we might think he means every person in the world. And you have to wonder about that sometime. But what if he means so much more than that? In his letter to the Roman Christians, the Apostle Paul wrote about future glory. And this is what he said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory about to be revealed to us for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom and glory of the children of God. And then Paul writes this wonderful image. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we await adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. And Paul says, now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Throughout life, and especially during the Advent season, we hope for what we do not see. And our Lord calls us to wait for it with patience. When the existential threats or just the ordinary demands of everyday living threaten to extinguish our hope, not just for the future, but especially for the present. Jesus says, stand up, raise up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. So this Advent, may we slow down and take the time to concentrate, to feel our heartbeat, to listen for the whole world holding its breath. Years ago, my mom gave me and Nancy a book of Advent and Christian Christmas devotions by Ann Weems called Kneeling in Bethlehem. Every Advent season, I pull it off my bookshelf and I flip through it and I reread some of the, her poems. The first section of the book is about Advent. The first poem in the first section of the book seemed especially appropriate for today's Advent message from Luke 21. It's called The Coming of God. Our God is the one who comes to us in a burning bush, in an angel's song, in a newborn child. Our God is the one who cannot be found locked in the church, not even in the sanctuary. Our God will be where God will be with no constraints, no predictability. Our God lives where our God lives, and destruction has no power, and even death cannot stop the living. Our God will be born where God will be born, but there is no place to look for the one who comes to us. When God is ready, God will come, even to a God-forsaken place like a stable in Bethlehem. Watch, for you know not when God comes, Watch that you might be found whenever and wherever God comes. Let us pray. Righteous God, to you alone we lift our souls. In you alone we place our trust. For you alone we wait all day long. For you are the God of our salvation, abounding in mercy and steadfast love. Help us remain alert and watchful for the coming of your promised one, the one who comes with power and glory, the one drawing near to bring our salvation. Amen.
As we pray today, let us continue to pray for families that are grieving, especially over this holiday time, for Dana Myrick, for Gerard Lowry and his family, for Donna and Denny Lanier. We pray for Effie Mobley and for Cameron Lee. And again, I ask you if you would continue to pray for my friend David Whiteman. Let us pray together. We thank you, Lord, that your promises are true and trustworthy, that nothing we can do or not do will keep them from being fulfilled. Lord, during this Advent season, help us to look back, not just to Bethlehem, but way beyond Bethlehem, to hear and see again how you have always been faithful to your promises to your people, have always delivered your people. And with that assurance, help us this Advent season to look ahead, not just to celebrating Christmas, but for the living of each day and for the hope we have throughout life and in the face of death. We thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to be the light of the world. Help us to walk in that light. Help us to stand up and lift our heads and be watchful and to be ready. We thank you for bringing your kingdom into our world and giving us a glimpse of your peace and hope and joy and love. And help us remember that you expect us to live that way, not just to hope for those things someday in the future, but to show that in our lives every day. Lord, help us to do that as your people. Lord, we pray for everyone for whom the holidays are very difficult. We pray for Dana, for Gerard, for Denny and Donna, for their families. We carry so many friends and loved ones in our hearts who mourn. And in the midst of all these celebrations, we pray that you would comfort them, strengthen them with exactly the message that we are celebrating, that Jesus is the Lord of life, that Jesus is our redemption that Jesus is the light of the world. We thank you that you sent a Savior who lived like us, who knows what our lives are like, who went through everything that we go through. And with thanksgiving, we offer prayers for comfort and strength for all those who are going through difficult times. We thank you for people who are recovering. We pray for Effie, for Cameron, and for others who are making their way back from times of illness and surgeries. Lord, I pray for David and Harriet as he is under a hospice care. I thank you for his spirit, for his friendship, for his trusting faith in you. And I pray for your comfort to be with him and Harriet and their family. Lord, we get more disconcerting news this week about COVID-19. We pray that we will be guided by the wisdom of those who are studying this, that we can be safe. We pray for people who are still suffering from the disease, for the workers, nurses, doctors, caretakers. Continue to pray for our teachers, students, staff, principals, superintendents, parents, and families through a challenging school year. Lord, be with us during this Advent season. Slow us down. Still our hearts. Let us listen for you as we anticipate the coming of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship as we bring our tithes and offerings, our special offering today in response to God's grace and mercy in our lives. Our offertory was written by Pepper Choplin, commissioned by our church for our 125th anniversary celebration back in 2009. It has an official title, but we refer to it as our song, and the choir will be singing it. Separate us from the 
as we share our offerings with you, we are filled with hope. We enter this season of Advent with expectation in the midst of a time of fear, isolation, and uncertainty. We raise our heads because we know our redemption is coming near. May our gifts be dedicated to help heal the brokenness of our world and to welcome our Messiah into the world once again. In Christ we pray, amen. Wednesday night we ate supper at the Carnegie Diner right near Carnegie Hall and it reminded me of what a wonderful trip we had two years ago when our choir sang under the direction of Pepper Choplin in Carnegie Hall and now you know why. <laughs> Would you affirm your faith with me from a brief statement of faith? In life and in death we belong to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come Lord Jesus, with believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Number 82, come thou long expected Jesus. Be people of hope. Let hope live in your heart and share the hope of Christ with all you meet. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share hope. As you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share God's hope with those you meet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Amen.